What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here. We're gonna talk about a topic that every single year seems to come up, but every summer I also like to do the summer of water cooling, but today we're just gonna talk about some water cooling topics. And that is, is water cooling dead? With the efficiency of air coolers these days and then the power requirements of CPUs sort of coming down over time, the question is, is it even worth bothering with water anymore? With no parts markup and only a $75 build fee, Redux gaming PCs are the obvious choice for gamers who demand the best without paying extra. With as little as a few clicks, you'll get a PC optimized for you and the games you play at a price that fits your budget, and all Redux PCs are backed by a two-year warranty. To see all that Redux has to offer and to start configuring your next PC, head to the link in the description below. All right, so first and foremost, let's just kind of talk about some of the, the basic fundamentals, the difference between water cooling and air cooling. Both of them use air. Water coolers are still technically air exchangers because they're using air to cool the radiator. The radiator is just how we're moving the heat from one place to another and then getting it to the atmosphere. Air coolers do it in the same way. They transfer it through heat pipes, which usually now these are vapor chambers, which means they have a wick and they have a fluid in there, which is designed as it heats up to carry the heat through convection up into uh, the heat pipes and into the heat fin array or the heat sink array, which then your fan moves air through it to cool it. So essentially the anatomy of a water cooler and an air cooler are very similar. You have your cooling plate, which is in this case the pump uh, cold plate combo, which is what's touching the heat source to pull heat away from it. You've got your water pipes, which carries the fluid from one area to another. You've got your heat pipes, which take place in an air cooler to get it from the heat plate to the heat sink. You've got your radiator here, which has fans attached to it to move air through it to pull the heat out of the system, which is exactly what the heat sink fins are doing here. Uh, you have your fan moving through there, and then the heat sink fins are absorbing the heat and then moving it to the atmosphere. And then the uh, method at which the transfer is happening in this case is a pump physically moving water through the system, whereas this is happening through the actual heat differential between the cold plate and the fins and the wicking technique of how a vapor chamber works. So, Essentially, anatomy-wise, they're very, very similar. The difference is water has a much higher thermal capacity than air. The reason why I'm even telling you any of this is because back in the past, CPUs were extremely inefficient. They had very large processes versus where we are today. They also were very high heat loads, or, or, or wattage loads, we should say. Now, the typical usage of even a high core count CPU is about 95 watts. But if we were to go back just five or six years, when X299 was new and we were seeing eight core 16 thread processors, we were easily seeing 150 to 200 watts under full load conditions. But Jay, the TDP, well, TDP and actual heat load are not the same. There's a, there's a, they're totally different figures. You'd have to look into another video or another explanation as to why that is, but the realistic heat capacity at which we're dealing with here is much higher than the TDP. That's just power draw. Power draw and heat creation or heat itself is not the same figure. So water coolers were almost necessary if you wanted to maintain the turbo clocks for as long as possible and have your CPU not start to thermal throttle or is it thermal throttling? No, it's just working along a sliding scale of frequency to temperature ratio, which is all pre-programmed in there. Thermal throttling is when you go below your advertised speed because it's trying to keep itself from dying because it's getting too hot. That's the official difference between thermal throttling and a thermal scale. But water, because it has a much higher thermal capacity and it's much faster at absorbing that heat through the cold plate made it almost necessary if you were running anything like a Threadripper or a high core count Xeon or even uh, you know a X299, like a 5960X type CPU, which was the first eight core 16 thread CPU that I ever used and going from a 4790K Devil's Canyon to X299 is why I ended up putting so many radiators in Skunk Works because it was so dang hot. However, 2021 is not exactly the same anymore. We've got core counts going up, which without the efficiency you're seeing now in CPUs, we're keeping the same exact TDP, about 95 watts, only the core counts continue to increase and the core clocks are coming up with it. So for that reason is why we're seeing such a close uh, delta or temperature delta between AIOs slash custom loops and air coolers these days because the necessity of carrying away heat has declined over the years. Or I should say at least stayed the same as the core counts and efficiency of processors increased we're seeing a lot less power needed to run these high-end CPUs. So some might argue at that point, water cooling is dead. Well, that's not always the case. Let's go ahead and talk about the efficiencies of water cooling in the environment. Air coolers and water coolers are definitely direct one-to-one -one ratios between the environment at which they're in. What I mean by that, if you've got 
a 22 Celsius degree environment. Your computer is in a room that's 22 Celsius and your CPU is running at 70 Celsius because of the under load and, and the air that's going through the radiator. If your room increases one Celsius, so will the temperature of your CPU because the CPU, if you're, now this is also theoretically that you're at full speed on the pump, you're full speed on the fans, you've got it's maxed out on its cooling capability. As the environment increases, so will the temperature of the cooler. There's no arguing that. The coldest a water cooler could ever possibly get is the exact temperature of ambient. And creating that is nearly impossible because there is obviously a rise in temperature of the fluid because it's absorbing heat that's hotter than the environment itself. So you'll never get it to be perfectly ambient, but that's the best you could ever possibly hope for. The difference is the thermal capacity of water. Air has a lot less thermal capacity. The amount of fins that are on your cooler are obviously gonna dictate how cool that can get. What we have here is a twin tower or a dual tower CPU cooler, which is essentially two of these, right? Stacked front to each other, where instead of the fins or the heat pipes coming out from the side, they come out longitudinal, depending on which way you or or orient it. And then you've got two of those pipes. So you got the same amount of pipes essentially, but two towers that's creating an environment for air to be dissipated or heat to be dissipated through the transfer of, uh, of air going through the cooler. That's fine in almost every environment. But let's say, for instance, you're in the Pacific Northwest and you're experiencing heat that you have never experienced before because you typically have a very cool, albeit very humid environment. You'll notice your PC temps are usually fine because the hottest you might ever see in the summertime is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. But now you're dealing with, you know, 40 degrees Celsius. And yes, I know I just switched between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Sorry, I'm dual language here when it comes to temps. You're now noticing your PC temps are probably higher than you've ever seen as well. And that's because the environment increased. Now, those that are running water coolers are gonna notice that that temperature didn't increase by quite as much. And the reason for that is gonna be just because of the thermal capacity of the water itself. Now, over time, if you're running long gaming sessions or long rendering sessions or whatever, you'll notice the temperature start to come up. But the drawback to water coolers though is because they're so efficient at pulling as much heat as possible out of the system, you're gonna notice your room is probably gonna get warmer too because you are more efficiently taking the heat out of the CPU and into the air. Whereas those with air coolers might not notice their room get quite as hot when it comes to air coolers versus water coolers. So both have their pros and their cons. Water cooling for the most part though, is uh, it, it's more of a niche thing these days. It's not nearly as necessary, but it's not going away. I've seen a lot of people argue in videos saying water cooling is unnecessary, it's stupid, why does it still exist? Well, it still exists because more people are actually putting AIOs in their computers these days than they are air coolers because of the fact that they, depending on the size of the AIO that you get, there's a crossover between air coolers and AIOs. Sometimes you can get a cheaper 100 or a 240 millimeter AIO than say something like a big Dark Rock Pro or a Noctua D16 or something like that, where it's gonna cost more. The drawback is you have more moving parts. Specifically, the part that matters most is the pump itself. If the pump fails, which is one of the things people hated about AIOs, all in one water cooling units versus a open loop, which has custom parts that you connect yourself, uh, is about the longevity and the lifespan. Now, AIOs, typically would have a very small cold plate, very thin, which limits the amount of transfer that you get itself because the cold plate will absorb the temperature from the CPU and then the water will absorb the temperature from the cold plate. So you have a bigger thermal mass between the two, which takes a little bit longer to get to full temp, but once it does, you'll notice your overall temps are much lower on a water cooler than most air coolers, depending on the situation. The pump itself is usually the weak point. A lot of these are based off of an Asetek design, which holds a major patent in the United States. So in order to run an AIO, depending on various loopholes in the patent, you'll find most of them are based off an Asetek design. Almost all round ones are Asetek, where a lot of the square ones are, are custom one-offs. Uh, but what you'll notice here with Corsair's latest coolers, you added a little fill plug. And the reason for that is that specifically is designed to deal with the other issue of AIOs, which is, um, Permeation, is that the right? Yeah, permeation, that's where it actually will evaporate through the tubes. Because even if it's sealed, it's never 100% sealed. And over time, you'll notice you'll start to have some fluid loss. And that was a, a major drawback to water cooling, specifically with AIOs, a custom loop, you can just open the cap of your reservoir and top it back off and you're good to go. But even though it's come pre-filled and pre-bled where all the, as much of the air as possible can, is out of the system, you'll have permeation where you start to lose fluid through the tubes and other areas that are not completely non-porous. And so you'll start to hear the pump whirring, you'll start to hear some trickling, it starts to sound like a, a, a fish tank. 
and then that's when you know it's time to get rid of your AIO. But now that we're starting to see companies add these little fill ports at a very strategic spot, which would allow you to take it out of your system, put this at the highest point of the loop, open that cap, get a tiny little funnel, little squeeze bottle, and just kind of cap it off, you know, top it off, get it as high as you can, and then you're up and running again. The cold plate design improvements and the pump designs have also made AIOs just that much more efficient. But the other thing is like, now we're getting giant AIOs. Like this is the H170i from Corsair. This is a 420 millimeter radiator, three 140 millimeter fans, which means if you want to have the quietest system, not just the coolest, but the quietest system, you scale up to a larger radiator, you run bigger fans at lower RPMs, which means more surface area, more airflow without as much noise. The difference between air coolers and water coolers for the most part, the air cooler is still completely dependent on the case itself to exhaust the hot air, which this is putting into the case. Whereas AIOs, if they're mounted onto the exhaust or the top of your case, are completely independent of the actual case itself, well, almost independent. Where as long as you have enough airflow into the case and you balance your pressure right, you're gonna be a much more efficient air transfer of having the radiator at the very top, exhaust the air directly out of your case means you're not gonna have as much neighboring heat absorption into components. For instance, your graphics card isn't gonna have a hot CPU cooler right next to it. Um, it's kind of the same example of like a blower style cooler where it takes almost all of the air through a cooler of the GPU and exhausts it out the back of the case. Whereas a axial fan, which has the three fans or the two fans is exhausting into the case and the case has to take the heat out means that you are uh, more efficiently taking the heat out of your system. Another positive of water cooling is the fact that depending on your case, you can fit anywhere from a 120, 240, 360 or now 420 radiator inside of your system, giving you a ton of thermal capacity directly relating to the cooling of your CPU, where with an air cooler, this all has to fit right on top of the CPU, meaning you're never gonna get the amount of volume and heat transfer out of an air cooler that you can out of water and a radiator. Now it's getting close. The, the technology, especially the addition of vapor chambers has made that much less of a spread that it used to be. However, if we continue to see CPU scaling up more and more and more, eventually air coolers are gonna have to evolve in some way to get even larger and probably stand even farther away and be more like spread out like an air cooler or a water cooler is. Um, but, you know, obviously air coolers have their place. They are simple. The only moving part in it is the fan. And as long as you keep your case clean and you don't have a ton of dust accumulation on your fan, it will probably never fail on you before you upgrade. Or you're probably gonna change your fan anyway to something that's uh, RGB if it's not. Or you can always upgrade your fan to a higher RPM, which gives you a little bit more cooling capacity of your air cooler. Sure, you can do that with radiators as well, but in my opinion, one of the benefits of water cooling is the noise trade-off for the, the heat transfer. The downside of, water, of, of air coolers though, is their size. And what you'll often find is bigger air coolers, like this Be Quiet Pro, Dark Rock Pro here versus this Noctua is, let's say you've got this one. This is the one you bought at the time you built your system. And you wanna upgrade your CPU and you had yourself like a Ryzen 5 1700, which is not a bad CPU, but it's older and the core counts have definitely gone up since you get that. If you wanted to put in something like a 5950X, this little guy right here would barely get the job done. And you might find yourself not maintaining turbo clocks or, or even just getting a little bit too warm and starting to deal with some sort of thermal throttling because of the fact that this cooler was not designed for that level of heat load. Whereas water coolers give you a lot of headroom in how much heat they're able to handle. So then you're buying yourself another water or air cooler, something like the Dark Rock Pro, which is designed to handle that type of heat load. But now you're gonna start to, having issues where does it fit on your motherboard? Is there gonna be issues with your RAM not clearing because of how big the cooler is? Is it gonna interfere with the VRMs that are now getting bigger and bigger on motherboards because of the fact that they, again, the big power draw or the big, the amount of power draw capable uh, 5950X is under load and the amount of heat that that VRM is gonna generate delivering all of the, you know, 1.45 volts to 16 cores is gonna create through the VRM those heat sinks are getting bigger and taller and thicker, which now I've seen more often than not, big coolers start to interfere with those, which means you have to do some serious research to figure out if the big giant cooler you're getting is gonna actually clear any of that. And then the bracket systems themselves sometimes being almost impossible to reach depending on how old the cooler is or how well they thought it out. Thought it out. We're trying to get it mounted down, especially on Intel, like a mainstream platform, not necessarily like 20, um, 2011 or something like that. But when it comes to mounting it down, sometimes it's kind of cumbersome to get it installed. There's trade-offs, there's pros, there's cons to all of it. Is it dead? Is it pointless? 
For many of you, you would say yes. What you do with your air cooler is enough to get the job done, and that's perfectly fine. And many people are, like myself are gonna almost always run water cooling because I love the way it looks, I like the heat efficiency of it, I like the fact that I can have way more cooling than I actually need, and it's, it's just some, it's way of life for me. I take the risk of it leaking all the time, but I also really like to, when I'm doing something that requires full load, look over at my motherboard and see what the temperatures are. And I like seeing 45 degrees on a 59, what, what do I have, 5900X in my system? Yeah, I know, I got a smaller one. Nick's, Nick's got a bigger CPU than me. I got CPU envy, but that's okay. I built it for him, so it's still mine. But I digress. They're not dead. They both have their place. And this is where you guys have to sound off in the comments below. Are you using water cooler? Is it an, if you're using water cooling, is it AIO or a custom loop? If you are, which, what are you using and what's your CPU and what are your temps like? Or are you using a high core count CPU with an air cooler? If so, what CPU, what air cooler, and what are your temps like? It'd be fun to kind of compare and contrast some of the results down there. Oh, and more importantly, how hot is your environment? That's a big one. We live in a hot environment. That's another reason why water cooling has always been something I've used. Thanks for watching, guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.